Okay. Yep, I think we're ready to go. All right, welcome everybody to um, this uh, virtual information event. Um, we're going to go through um, everything you need to know about treatment at Care Fertility. Um, so we'll share a few videos um, and there'll be a couple of Q&A sessions with um, Professor Kingsland. Um, my name, I should, I should say, is uh, Amy, uh, Amy Barry. I am the lab manager at Care Chester and Care Liverpool. Um, and I'm standing in for um, Alison Campbell, Director of Embryology, um, this evening. So um, the event itself, we're going to go through um, the IVF pathway, so what's involved in treatment. Um, we're going to talk about diagnosing a fertility problem, um, treatment with donor eggs and sperm, um, and talk about the techniques that we use in the lab. Um, and we'll go through a bit about support at care, um, funding for your treatment, um, and getting started. So if you want to ask any questions, um, you can ask them in the private questions tab um, or the public chat. If you put anything in the, in the chat, then everyone can see um, your name just to make you aware. Um, but you can also send any questions um, to the email address, which is events at carefertility.com. We're going to try and answer as many questions as we possibly can in the two Q&A sessions that we've got scheduled. But if we don't have any time um, to answer your particular question, then we'll send you a reply um, after the event um, via email. Um, we've also got the new patient inquiry team um, on the phones until eight o'clock this evening to answer any queries that might come up. Um, so you can get them on um, the patient inquiry team number, which is pens at the ready, 0800 564 2270. So we're going to start off with a short video um, just introducing you to care. family. It's who we are and who we're always going to be. It's the important little moments, the big emotions, the beating heart at the centre of our world. It's the journey that we take there, together, one step at a time. Family is the one thing we'll always care about the most because we believe that family is for everyone. And through our care, we'll do everything we can to make your dream real. We don't just care, we are care. Uh, my name is Professor Charles Kingsland and I'm the Group Clinical Director for care fertility. At CARE, our number one belief is family for everyone. And this means we do everything possible to help everyone start or grow their family. We know that nothing is as important as family. And that's why we care so much about wanting to give every patient that comes to us their best chance of having a baby. Of course, families come in all shapes and sizes. We get heterosexual couples, couples of the same sex. We get uh, single patients wanting to, uh, to start a family, we get NHS patients. When you have a fertility problem, there should be facilities available for you to get the best advice and the best treatment readily available to give you the best chance of having a baby at a time in your life that is best for you. We will use all our knowledge and experience combined with highly individualised treatment personal treatment to help you have the family you are longing for. Unbeknown to Gemma and I, uh, we both carry a gene, um, a deafness gene. We actually have a daughter um, who, who was three, but who was born prematurely deaf. And we 
were given the option and chose to go down a fertility treatment to kind of avoid our second child having that same gene. We were very lucky in the fact that um, the clinic was only down the road from us. So we felt there was one around the corner. It was had good reviews. We just felt it was good for us, didn't we? The whole package made us just feel really comfortable that actually going with care was the right decision. So the team, the team that we worked with at CARE were unbelievable. They were caring, they were sensitive, they were compassionate, empathetic. Um, and even when I was ringing out with, um, I was feeling pains down one side, that the reassurance that they gave me, uh, they honestly do hold your hand every single step of the way. And I feel like they lived the journey with us. So I've had several treatments with CARE and I now have a baby, and that's taken um, a number of treatments, fertility treatments, different alternatives, different medicines to try and get it to work for me. I have always said I would recommend Care Fertility. I would recommend them for the, the comfort factor that I received, the friendliness, and just my, I think the word is, my faith in Care Fertility. Okay, so we're going to go on to um, the presentation. Um, so I'll just load this up. Okay, so one in six people need help starting a family. Um, and we really truly believe that family is for everyone. Um, and as you saw in the video, um, Charles was saying that we help lots and lots of different types of patients, heterosexual couples, same-sex couples, single patients, um, and those looking for fertility preservation. Um, so during this presentation, we're going to refer to the general IVF process. Obviously, everyone's treatment will be individualized, um, but whether you're using your own eggs or sperm or with the help of a donor, um, the principles are the same. So... We've got a number of clinics throughout the UK um, and over in Dublin. Um, and that means that we can really um, provide treatment to everyone um, across the country. Um, we've got some bigger clinics and some smaller clinics, but it means that the patients benefit from um, lots and lots of knowledge, lots and lots of um, experts, but still getting that feel of um, a, a nice um, clinic environment. So it's really easy to get started with treatment at care. This is Shah, um, the uh, general inquiry team manager. Um, the new patient inquiry team are really knowledgeable. They try and answer as many questions for you as possible um, about the treatment and getting started. Um, and as I said, they're, they're available until eight o'clock tonight if you wanted to get in touch. Um, and the new patient inquiry team leader, Lauren, um, she's part of our events team tonight as well, and she'll be answering questions um, for you in the questions tab if you have any. So the first step in, in the process really is to get a diagnosis, and that's really important to make sure that the treatment that you're getting um, is appropriate to you. So um, we take the time to get to know everything about you, um, we gather all of, the, all of the possible information that we can, and we can do this through various means. But one of the things that we have that's really good is the online patient portal. Um, so this is a secure online portal, um, and it's available to all care patients. Um, and it can be accessed on lots of different devices, desktop, laptop, mobile phone, tablet. Um, and it's basically every every where we would put everything for you and where you will put everything for us. So you can upload previous medical notes with um, histories and uh, test results. Um, and we, similarly, we can provide you with information on specific tests that you want information for. Um, so 
In terms of when you upload information to the portal, sometimes um, you have got results for tests that we would recommend. And so you don't need to have those tests again um, if, they're, if they're quite recent. So it's a good place to keep all of the information for, for both you and, and CARE. Um, so all the information on this portal that you upload um, is reviewed by the consultant prior to the appointment to make sure that they've got all the information that they need um, to give you the right information for your treatment. So in the consultation, um, this is George, one of the consultants from Sheffield. Um, the consultant is going to listen to your fertility plans, your wishes. Um, they're going to have a look at your test results and explain um, any further tests that they think you might benefit from or that they think you might need. Um, they'll discuss the different treatment options that are appropriate to you um, and give you the chances of success of those treatment options. What they'll do is give you detailed information and that will be, as I said, uploaded to your secure portal and you can go away and read that information in your own time and make sure that you feel like you, you're making um, a, a, an informed decision about any treatment that you're going to proceed with. Um, they'll let you know uh, how you can access support in care, which we think is really important, and they'll talk to you a little bit about costs involved in, in the treatment as well. We make sure that they're going to give you all the time that you would need to ask the questions that you want. Um, but also after your consultation, we're there um, for you to come back to us and ask any more questions if you wanted to. So whether the problem that you have is simple or whether it's more complex, um, we have a depth of experience to give you the best chance of starting or growing your family. So the first step um, once you embark on the treatment cycle is to um, go through ovarian stimulation um, and then we'll, I'm going to go through each of these um, areas in a little bit more detail. So the ovarian stimu stimulation, the monitoring and the egg and the sperm collection. So as I said at the beginning, everyone's different and each treatment will be individualised based on, on your needs. Um, you may not need IVF, you may wish to try IUI, intrauterine insemination instead, but most care patients need IVF. So we're going to go through the IVF journey. Um, and a, a reminder, we do see lots of different patients, so this is kind of broad, um, but should, should be relevant um, to your experience. So firstly, um, we need to stimulate the ovaries and we do this so that we get a good number of eggs for the treatment cycle. So usually each month a single egg is released, um, but obviously we want to collect more than a single egg in a treatment cycle. So we prescribe medication to stimulate the ovaries um, and to grow follicles, which would hopefully contain an egg. The medication protocol um, that you receive will be explained to you by the nursing team um, and they'll be able to give you information on how to inject um, the medication and there's also really helpful online videos um, that you can access when you've gone away from the clinic so that you can remind yourself about how to do the injections. So once you've started the injections for the ovarian stimulation, we obviously then need to check that you're responding to that medication. So we do this through ultrasound um, scans. Um, so we tend to monitor this um, usually bet for between three and seven days. But it, again, it's dependent on you as a patient um, and how you're responding. But once we're happy that we've got a good number of follicles developing, we will prescribe the final trigger injection, which is what helps the eggs reach their final stage of maturity so that they're ready for the next step in the process. The trigger injection is usually administered in the evening and then your egg collection would be scheduled around 36 hours later. So the egg collection process is um, relatively straightforward. Um, it's ultrasound, um, it's all done under ultrasound guidance. 
um, and a needle is directly um, placed into the ovaries uh, where the eggs are removed from the follicles. It's around 30 minutes. It can take less time, it can take more, depending on how many follicles have developed. Um, so you'll have the procedure and then you'll have a short rest in the clinic and um, then you should be ready to go home pretty, pretty soon after that. So once we've got the eggs, um, we obviously need to get the sperm. Now, this will be dependent on um, your treatment type in particular, um, but usually the, the preparation method for the sperm is the same. So we like to get as, as the sperm sample um, on the same day that the eggs are collected. And we prepare the sperm sample in the lab to make sure that um, all the good sperm are harvested so that we can go ahead with the um, fertilisation process. So at the moment, because of COVID, we're operating um, COVID secure practices. So we, we're asking um, if there is a sample um, to be produced by a, a partner that that's dropped off in the clinic. Um, sometimes the sample is um, retrieved by minor surgery uh, or it might be previously frozen um, depending on your treatment. So I've just got a short video um, with some uh, some fun videos of sperm. So I'll just load that up. So we can see here um, sperm being tracked uh, with a um, very cool bit of equipment. So that's telling us how well the sperm are moving, how many there are, um, and that helps us determine whether there's enough sperm there for the IVF procedure or whether we may need to perform the ICSI procedure instead. So this computer's um, in quite a few of our labs and that tells us um, how they're looking as well. So you can see along the right hand side, it says abnormal morphology. So that's, that's the way that they're looking. And this bit of equipment tells us if the sperm look good. So we'll just go back to the presentation. So we've got the eggs and we've got sperm. Um, so now we obviously need to go through um, the fertilization process. So we can do this by two methods. We can either do it by IVF or we can do it by ICSI. So IVF is where we would um, prepare the sperm sample, make sure that we've got all the good sperm, and then put a bit of that sperm sample in with the eggs in the dish. Um, leave them overnight and then check them for fertilization in the morning. ICSI is a little bit more involved where um, we would use um, a, a set of needles to manually inject a single sperm into each one of the mature eggs. And this ICSI is usually used for patients where the number of sperm in the sample is low or how fast they're moving is low or whether they don't, um, whether the way that they look is, is, is particularly low as well. The method of fertilization, whether we do IVF or whether we do ICSI, is predetermined based on um, a semen analysis that you would have had prior to starting treatment. But obviously, on the day of the treatment, on the day of the egg collection and the, and the sample preparation, sometimes the sample may not reach the parameters that we need to proceed with IVF, in which case we would talk to you about going um, moving to ICSI instead. So, I've got a picture, um, a video, sorry, of the ICSI process. So I'm just going to load that up. And this is a really cool video um, that shows you how we do the ICSI. So you can see the egg there in the middle and then the sperm coming down the needle on the right-hand side and the needle just going into the egg gently um, and then the sperm um, being released into the center of the egg, nice and gently, and then the needle being removed. Okay, so we've either done the IVF or we've done the ICSI and either way the egg and the, the eggs and the sperm get left in the incubator safely overnight and then we check them 
first thing um, the next day to see how many of the eggs have fertilized. So it's unlikely that all of the eggs would fertilize, um, but we, we, we usually get somewhere around 70% of, of the eggs would fertilize. And we, we look for specific structures within the, within the egg that shows us that the egg has fertilized normally. So this is Alex, one of the lab managers in London, um, and she's looking at one of the um, incubators that we use, which is called an embryoscope. And this is a, um, another really good bit of equipment that takes an image of all of the eggs um, inside it every five to 10 minutes. And we end up with um, lots and lots of images of embryo development over the course of their time in the lab um, with us. So as soon as we, we know that the eggs are fertilized, we then class them as embryos, um, and then we start assessing them for um, development. So we would, once we've checked the eggs and we know how many are fertilized, we'll get in touch with you as soon as possible, and we'll let you know how many, um, how many embryos you've got. And that'll be, um, that'll be the next time you hear from us after your egg collection, will be to tell you um, how many embryos you have. So the embryo development part of it is really fascinating. Um, uh, I work in the labs and that's, that's what I love. Uh, but what we sometimes end up with is lots of embryos to pick from. And sometimes it's difficult for us to know which of a group um, is the most likely to create a baby. It's unlikely that all of the embryos in a cohort will create a baby, very unlikely. But we want to be able to give you the best chance um, first of all, um, on your first treatment cycle. So we've got two things um, that we predominantly use to select embryos to give you the best chance. And the first one um, that I'll talk about is Care Maps. So Care Maps is a um, unique to care, um, and it's a, a result of decades of research and um, lots and lots of images from lots and lots of embryos, tens of thousands of embryos. And what we've done is analysed how embryos that create um, pregnancies develop compared to how embryos that don't create pregnancies develop. And we've been able to work out certain patterns in an embryo's behavior that indicate that it's more likely to create a baby. Um, so with the Care Maps um, technology, out of a cohort of embryos, we're able to assess which one is the most likely to create a baby for you. Um, and that means that we're giving you the best chance of success first time around. The next um, bit of technology that we use is something called PGTA. Um, some of you have asked a few questions about that, I can see. Um, it used to be called PGS, so it's the same thing. Um, and this is where we remove some cells from the developing embryo. You can see in the image on the right hand side um, that we're taking some cells away in the needle there. And we send those cells away to a genetics lab for testing. Um, the results from that testing tell us if the embryo has got the right number of chromosomes, the right, the right amount of DNA, or whether it's got the wrong amount of chromosomes, um, wrong amount of DNA. And if it has got the wrong amount of DNA, then it means that it's unlikely to create a pregnancy. And in fact, we don't um, transfer what we call aneuploid embryos, abnormal embryos. But if the results come back that the embryo is normal or euploid, um, then we can be um, pretty confident that that's a, a good embryo um, and we can go ahead and transfer that embryo for you. So I'm going to share a video of the um, care maps to give you a bit of an overview of how that works. So this is a developing embryo, you can see. This is around day four of development after egg collection. Um, so what we start to see is a um, cavity forming in the middle, and then the cells start to move towards the edge of the outer shell that you can see. And it starts to expand and grow in size. And this is now what we would call a blastocyst. This is what we would hope for on day five or day six of embryo development. 
And it's when it's at this stage that we're able to remove some of the outer cells um, and send those off for testing for the PGTA. Okay, so once we've decided which embryo is the best one out of the bunch, um, then we would obviously aim to perform an embryo transfer for you. So they're usually performed under ultrasound guidance, so we can see um, that we're putting the embryo back into the right place. So the embryos, embryo or embryos are loaded into a soft catheter, and this is inserted through the vagina and the cervix and then into the womb. It's a short procedure, about 15 minutes, um, and afterwards you can go about your normal activities um, or you can take a rest if, if you would prefer, whichever, whichever suits you. And after this is what we call the two week wait. And so this is where you um, wait and hope that the embryo has implanted and we would ask you to take a pregnancy test um, at home. Uh, to see if the transfer has been successful. So we usually say the pregnancy test is about 14 to 16 days after the transfer. If it comes back as positive, then we will bring you in a few weeks later to do an ultrasound scan for um, to check to see if we can see a fetal heartbeat um, uh, on that ultrasound scan. And then if we can see a heartbeat, then we would discharge your TGP um, and hope that everything goes okay with the pregnancy. If it's a negative result, um, then obviously we would offer you support. We have counsellors available, um, readily available to offer support. And then we'd get you arranged, um, get you booked in for a follow-up appointment to discuss the next steps. Um, if you want to proceed with any more treatment um, and of course you can just get in touch with us when you're ready to move on. So that's kind of a whistle stop tour of a treatment cycle um, and I'll say it again that every treatment is different so this is a, a broad overview of what would be involved in a treatment cycle um, at CARE. So I'm going to talk about the other other things that care have to offer. Um, firstly, uh, donation. So we know that love makes a family and so we're, we're very pro donation um, and we can offer lots and lots of different treatment options to help everyone and anyone have a baby. And there's many different reasons why you would want to use um, donation or donor eggs, donor sperm or donor embryos. Um, our donation teams have got over 25 years of experience and they've helped more people start a family with the help of a donor than any other clinic in the UK. We offer complete support throughout the entire process uh, from your initial questions, your initial um, query, right the way through to helping you select a donor. And we have really specialist counselling um, for those having treatment with donor eggs, sperm or embryos. We think that support at care um, is really important. Uh, it's it's an emotional roller coaster, and we think that you you know you should have access to the support that you need. So we've got lots of different ways that you can get support at care. Obviously, we're always on the end of the phone, um, and we have um, lots of counselling um, counsellors available. We have free counselling appointments, so you can access those uh, whenever you feel you need to. And we've also got the buddy system where you would be paired up with someone else um, going through fertility treatment and you can support each other through the journey. We run regular support events, um, regular online support groups, um, and hopefully in-person meetups will be starting up um, really soon. There's also the 24 seven care online forum um, so you can chat to other patients in the care community um, uh, about their treatment and support each other that way. And as I said, there's the support of all of the care teams. Um, you can always pick up the phone uh, every moment in your treatment um, and ask questions and we can get you to the right to the right people as and when you need it. 
So just a little bit on care pay, which is something else that we offer to try and make the treatment process as straightforward as possible. So it's obviously a exclusive IVF funding program um, and it makes your treatment easier to manage from a financial perspective, but arguably an emotional perspective as well. Um, they're individually tailored treatment packages designed to give you the peace of mind, financial peace of mind, um, knowing that a plan's in place for funding of your treatment. Um, it's quite a, a recent addition and we created CarePay um, following patient feedback. Um, and it's managed entirely in-house, nothing is outsourced. Our teams are very knowledgeable um, and it means that you've got a more seamless experience from the very beginning all the, all the way to the end. So all the care pay programs, and there, there are a number of them, that, but they all include the cycle monitoring, the egg collection, all of the embryology procedures, uh, embryo transfer, freezing and storage, unlimited embryo transfers, um, blastocyst culture and care maps um, included as an extra benefit to give you um, the best chance of success. Okay, so I think we're going to move on to the Q&A. There's been plenty of um, questions popping up uh, and I'm hoping Professor Charles Kingsland is going to join me shortly. Um, I'll just see where he is. Hello. Here we are. Hello. What about that? <laughs> Excellent. Seamless. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Do you know what? Um, I think sometimes I need IT counselling. <laughs> I don't know whether they care do that, but if they did, I'd, we'll, I'd first we'll start you. it just for you. Oh, thank you, <laughs> thanks, Amy. I've, I've listened to you with interest. Anyway, that's um, that's a really good insight into what uh, what um, what IVF is all about. Yeah. You make it sound so simple. <laughs> okay, so should we just dive right in? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to yes. fire away? Sure. And um, and then um, I'll answer which questions are appropriate for me. And likewise, I'll hand them over to you if your expertise sure. is needed. Perfect. Yes. So we've got quite a few that have popped through um, whilst we've been going. Um, but we had a, a, a few um, sent through beforehand. So we'll start with a couple of those ones. So um, can PGTA help for recurrent implantation failure? Or is there anything else that you would suggest? Well, yes, it can. As as you've explained, Amy, um, it we, we can go as far as we possibly can to say which which embryos are likely to turn to babies on what they look like on the morphology. But to really know, um, you need to biopsy those embryos to see whether they are genetically normal or abnormal. And we know in humans that the vast majority of miscarriages are because of abnormal embryos it's rare for a for a, um, a woman to lose a normal baby a normal embryo and that's um uh, 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 we do obviously we see those those sorts of patients as, as well but i would say that in cases where um, couples have lost babies early on in pregnancy it is a treatment which is well worth thinking about it doesn't make your embryos better but it enables us to find out exactly the genetic constitution of those embryos and then which ones are likely to carry on to a live birth and which ones are likely to miscarry and for that reason we wouldn't we wouldn't put back the embryos which were what we call non-viable because that is is traumatic and it is and, and for anybody who's suffered miscarriage, people know just how how traumatic um, that can be. So in answer to your question, PGTA can be very useful in the right in the right circumstances. And it's always useful to speak to your fertility doctor or nurse practitioner about whether PGTA might be right for you. But in those circumstances where you've miscarried, twice or three times, PGTA is certainly something to think about. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, would you recommend egg freezing for a low AMH of four? Um, well, a AMH is anti-malarian hormone. It stands for anti-malarian hormone. Anti-malarian hormone is the hormone that is secreted by your eggs. The more eggs you have, the more AMH you've got. It doesn't tell you about the quality of the eggs. There are lots of other things that tell you about the quality of your eggs, your age being the most important one. So if you are um, 25 years old with a low AMH, that uh, doesn't that might be better than if you're 45 with a high mh all that means you've got when you're 45 you've got a high number of eggs but they're 45 years old so they're less likely to be as viable uh, if you were younger with a low a low amh now in terms of having an amh of four that is lower than we would expect at um if you're 35 for example but that might be normal for you if you were over 35 or approaching 40 or indeed 40. so you can't really make an assessment of a low amh unless we know the the patient's age however let's just um say that if you're under 30 with a, an amh of four that may mean that you're going to run out of eggs earlier than you would like to and so if you're not planning a family at that particular stage in your life or want to delay your family, um, then it might be worthwhile freezing your eggs at that stage. If you're older, say you're in your late 30s or early 40s and your AMH is four, then realistically, that's um, it, it, it's going to be a less viable proposition because your egg numbers are low and they're older so if you're wanting to consider a family at the age of 40 say with the mh of four my advice to you would be um crack on um and, and use the eggs as opposed to as opposed to saving them because they're far less likely to be viable at that sort of stage yeah um could you talk about the initial tests that are re recommended for a female couple using donor sperm? Yeah, well, um, you know, as we as we um, say in care, family is for everyone. We treat um, heterosexuals, couples of the same sex, single women, and we um, do a lot of fertility preservation and fertility assessments. Now, everybody has different stories and it's the same for same-sex couples um sometimes um they want um a couple may want to have donor insemination or they might want to have ivf using one patient's uh, one uh, of 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 their eggs fertilized and put into the same person or it may be that they want to do something called shared motherhood that's where um um um, patient A has her eggs collected, fertilized, and then those embryos or one embryo is put into her partner so that the partner grows the baby, has the baby, delivers the baby, and she's the birth mother, but her partner is the genetic mother. And that's in becoming increasingly popular. It's not for everybody because everybody is writing their own chapter in their, in their life story. It might be right for some people now then if that's the case and the couple are undecided as to whether they're going to have one pair whether they're going to be a, um, a donor insemination using one um, a partner or whether they're going to use two partners or whether we're going to use the eggs from one or other that those those different combinations dictate what tests we do but as a rule of thumb if one of the couple is going to have the babies then they will need at least a check of their pelvis an ultrasound scan they will need a check of their ovarian reserve i.e an amh test that we talked about earlier or a test of their antral follicle count to see how many eggs they've got if their partner wants to act as the birth um, as the genetic mother then she too will need um, an AMH to see what her egg reserve is. So 
it re really depends on what the couple are thinking of doing and how they're going to grow their family. But as a minimum, we need to know egg count, ultrasound count, scan of the birth mother as a minimum. And then as a legal requirement for all couples undergoing IVF or treatment, we need to screen um, for potential infectious diseases such as hepatitis b hepatitis c hiv they are that's the law we have to do that so they're the tests and rubella of course they're the tests we would do as a minimum i think that about covers it don't yeah right amy yeah yeah perfect um so a little bit about egg quality we've got a couple of questions about that how can i improve my egg quality at the age of 40 is dhea useful um, and what about intralipids? Can they improve egg quality? Right. Well, first of all, intralipids do not improve egg quality. Um, they are something to do with implantation and, and it's a, a controversial subject. And obviously we haven't got time tonight to talk about that. Um, there are pros and cons for intralipid therapy, but it will not affect your egg quality. DHEA, dihydroepiandestine dione acetate, is a hormone that's a building block for estrogen. So the theory is, is that you take DHEA and in theory, it can have a, um, a positive effect on your egg quality. The science doesn't unequivocally prove that, but, um, you know, DHEA, if you want to do something, it won't do you any harm. Whether it does you any good is debatable. There are other things that you can do which are of far more benefit, and they are lifestyle changes. Um, as I say, you cannot necessarily improve the quality of your egg, but what you can do unequivocally is pre prevent the deterioration of your eggs further. So weight is always important. Uh, cutting out um, smoking, reducing alcohol, um, improving your nutrition, and that goes hand in hand with getting your body um, mass down to an ideal um, to an ideal size. Sometimes this is very, very difficult and challenging. And I know many patients have got have had inordinate difficulty, but to to get down to their best boxing weight. But, you know, there's no harm in trying. So those sort of lifestyle changes are every bit as important as nipping down to the health food shop to try and um, buy potions and, and pills that are that are um expect you're expected to improve your um your egg quality yeah there's a question that we get asked all the time isn't it how can i improve my egg quality but really yeah. if if there was something that you could do then we would be telling you to do it there'd Ex be there'd be no question with the exactly and if not if if we learn nothing else from this evening stop smoking anybody who's still smoking stop because that has a, a a de devastating effect on egg quality yeah um what's the difference between a cetratide trigger and a bucerolin trigger this is a very in detailed question and how do you select patients for short or long ivf well um we used to traditionally we used to always use long um protocols because we didn't have the drugs available to us at um early on in the the, the development of ivf that would enabled us to use short protocols so short protocols have been introduced slowly over time as we've got to learn how to use them um realistically generally speaking there is very little difference between a short protocol and a long protocol apart from the obvious that short protocols a lot shorter than long protocols the outcomes are very similar now one of the the problems that we have in ivf is a development of a syndrome called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and this is usually in younger women who have high amhs so they've got lots of eggs and we for um reasons that we don't actually fully know when we stimulate the ovaries um, to grow the eggs the ovaries go into overdrive and produce lots and lots of eggs and that can cause ovarian swelling it can cause leakage of fluid out of the ovaries and a biochemical upset that can actually have serious consequences so we try and avoid ovarian hyperstimulation if at all possible and one of the ways we can do that nowadays um, is instead of giving a, 
a standard trigger uh, of what we call um, gonazi or um, pregnil or prophasy, which matures the egg, but that has a side effect of provoking OHSS. We can trigger using cetratide or um, bucerolin, and these are um, what we call agonist triggers. Now, they have the benefit of almost reducing to zero the chance of OHSS if we think that that's going to happen. The downside to that trigger, though, is it, it messes up your endometrium so that we can't put a fresh embryo back because the endometrium is just not receptive. So what we do, and which is as every bit as, as beneficial, is with when you have an agonist trigger for fear of provoking OHSS, what we do is we collect the eggs, create the embryos, and then we freeze the embryos, hopefully when they're about five days old, and, and store them away nice and safely so that the endometrium or the or the patient can get over her egg collection, she can get over her, her impending ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, have a, a couple of months, six or so or weeks to recover, and then she can come back to us and we can re, re, we can create the perfect endometrium and then thaw one of those embryos out and replace it at exactly the right time in exactly the right env environment. And there are some cases now where we would say, that frozen embryos are as good, if not better, than putting fresh embryos back. Because sometimes when you stimulate ovaries, that can have a very positive effect to, on the stimulation and maturity of the eggs, but it can have a negative effect on the endometrium. So some advocates of frozen embryos would say it's much better to collect the embryos, create a bank of embryos, and then go away and recover and then start again and prepare a perfect endometrium <clears throat> and then put that embryo back. Freezing nowadays has very little detrimental, um, detrimental effect on the embryos, unlike 25 years ago when embryo freezing was far less predictable and safe. Nowadays, it's perfectly safe and the thaw rates are excellent in fact they're over about over 90 percent aren't they amy would you say yeah yeah even over 95 percent yeah yeah so we vet i i was talking to one of my colleagues just recently and and i said that frozen embryos uh, we were having a debate as to whether fresh or frozen embryos were best and i said well thaw rates now for frozen embryos are over 95 percent." and he said i don't believe you well actually it's true yeah. we very rarely lose mm. embryos to the freezing process and that's why nowadays we have the confidence of only having to put one embryo back at a time years ago we because we couldn't freeze as effective as we can now we used to put back more than one embryo because we you know in that in the hope that that um you know at least one of them would stick but one of the side effects of that was twin pregnancies and now of course we always see the happy healthy twins and patients often want twins when they've been trying for many many years to have the family that they were that they're longing for but twin pregnancies come with profound risks if you have two embryos put back you're five times more likely to miscarry and then, of course, for every set of health, happy, healthy twins, we don't see the unhealthy, premature or very ill or dying twins that um, that don't leave the hospital. So freezing embryos allows us to put back one embryo safely. So have as many embryos back as you like, but one at a time, because that gives you the best chance of having a happy, healthy family. Yeah. That was a very comprehensive answer for a question about triggers. <laughs> Sorry, you could have said. <laughs> it's okay. So, I is, think that, is that your euphemistic way of saying you don't have to go on, Professor Kingsland? <laughs> so, we'll leave the Q and A there, and we'll pick back up with the videos. Um, so, I'm just going to share a short video. It's about five minutes, um, and it's about. Um, your journey through care um, and how we can support you through the treatment and um, so that you'll hear from Shah um, and then from Dave who's our chief executive um, about life at care and our dedication to supporting you so I'm just going to find that video for you 
Get that loaded up. Yeah. I'm Shah, and I manage CARE's new patient inquiry team. We're here to make it easy for you to take your very first step in your fertility journey. We completely understand how nervous and excited you might be when you contact us. This is the start of a life-changing process and hopefully the beginning of an amazing future as a family. So it's really important that we give you all the information you need. That way, we can help you to feel much more comfortable and confident with your treatment. Whatever you need to talk about, I want to reassure you that no question is silly or trivial. We appreciate that there might be a lot to take in at first, but don't worry, we'll send you a clear information pack about the treatments you're interested in, and we're always here for any follow-up queries. My team also manage inquiries about care pay, our range of funding packages which are exclusive to care fertility patients. When you're ready, we can book you a virtual consultation with a specialist fertility doctor from your local care clinic. So if you want more information, have a question or wish to book an appointment, call my team. We want you to know that we are here for you at every stage of your fertility journey. We say that our patients become part of our care family and it's true. We care deeply about you and your future and our teams are here to make sure you have all the support you need. The reason why we chose CARE was just one, the care that they give you, um, the aftercare that they have available to you and the fact that they um, offer different forms of um, treatment um, and they listen to you. One thing that I've identified and what I've noticed when speaking to other um, people that I've met within the infertility community is there's a lot of clinics out there that don't necessarily listen to you as the patient. It was kind of a one size fits all, but with care that didn't seem to be the case at all. They took everything into consideration and they listened um, to your concerns. They listened to you as a person and they put a, a package and, and a process in place that will help you and, you know, fingers crossed will give you that positive result from the at the end of it so without a shadow of a doubt if I had to go through it again I would definitely go back to care. Oh the support at care was brilliant. Was brilliant yeah I mean the nurses were brilliant for us you feel so looked after yeah and cared, looked after and cared by, by the whole team we felt that they did care and it wasn't just for them mm. getting something out of it it was actually that I'm going to support them. Yeah, and they wanted it to work for us. Care Fertility started over 20 years ago with one clinic and the goal of helping patients achieve their dream of family through truly personal care and the most scientifically advanced fertility treatments. We've grown from that one clinic. We now have clinics across the UK and many people have become part of our care family with over 50,000 care babies in the world. But one thing has, and always will, remain the same. We care for each and every patient. We care about your dreams of having a baby, and we put our heart and soul into every aspect of what care can offer you. To provide you with the best care possible and to give you your best chance of success and treatment, we look to our own care family. From our consultants, embryologists, and nurses, to our admin teams and specialist fertility counsellors, we've also put a lot of thought into how we improve each and every step of your journey, which will no doubt begin with lots of questions. We know that thinking about starting IVF can be daunting for some, and that's why our care, patient services and support teams will always be there for you whenever you have a question, need advice or simply want someone to talk to so that you feel completely confident and in control of your fertility options. So yes, we have grown and developed over the years, but care and empathy are always at the heart of who we are. We are passionate about changing lives and creating futures, and I hope that this shines through in everything we do and everyone you meet at all of our clinics. We don't just care, we are care. Okay, so we were going to start a second Q&A session, um, but we've kind of run out of time somehow. So uh, we're going to skip the second Q&A, uh, but if you have uh, burning questions, then uh, I can see that the um, 
the inquiries team are, are answering questions on the chat and um, they're open till eight so you can give them a call or you can get them on the email address um, any questions that you want to ask so thanks for attending um, you can get more information or book an appointment um, on the phone number um, and we'll leave you with a few final words um, about care um, and how you can get in touch to learn more or to book a consultation. One in six people need help to grow their family. You're not alone. And our care family will do everything we can to help your dream of family come true. There are over 50,000 care babies in the world today. And behind this success is our promise to make more heartfelt dreams of family become reality by ensuring our care goes into everything we do for all our patients every single day. You will receive truly individualized treatment, a patient-centric approach with empathy at its heart. We understand how nervous and excited you might be about getting started, but you can be assured of kindness, empathy, and all the information you need from our new patient inquiry team. We are all here to make it easy for you to take your very first step in your fertility journey. Call our team on 0800 564 2270 to learn more and book an appointment. We don't just care, we are care.